Hello and welcome back to the Villa Villa podcast. I'm here with my good friend Dan Wiseman. As always, Dan, it's another Transfer Rumour Mill podcast. First of all, how are you doing? Second of all, it's a bit of an exciting one this week, isn't it, Dan? Yeah, for sure, man. I love how regular these these pods going out now. It feels like every every other day we're sat down talking about something new that's uh, either coming out of the club or coming out of the media or something like that. Um, exciting times for sure. Absolutely, and uh, you know, after we recorded our uh, reaction podcast to Sheffield United and, and preview Bristol City, literally as soon as I uh, as soon as I ended the Zoom call. Uh, I did my obligatory check of Twitter just while I'm getting the edit ready and I saw that Villa were linked with uh, Islam Asar, which is typical for us to end the podcast and uh, earn a rumour to come out like that. But we're here now talking about that and there's another big one, uh, which I'm sure you've all seen about James Milner now, but we're, we're going to get into those uh, during the podcast. Dan, I think first of all, we'll talk about what's more than likely the easier one, James Milner. He's apparently available for around £8 million. Leeds have been interested for the past year and a half. I think it's always been reported if Leeds come up, they want to bring Milner home. He's going to be the first signing in the Premier League. And at 34 years of age, Milner has aged like a fine wine, it's safe to say. He is a man who takes himself and his career so seriously. And I know, look, he's 34. It doesn't really fit the bill, but... You could argue he's better than all of our midfielders at the club at the moment. And for £8 million, which is essentially pennies in the modern game, it seems like a no-brainer, Dan, to bring Milner home. Yeah, I think it's one where um, like the, the, the fairy tale move for him is probably Leeds. Um, I'm sure that's probably where you know he's Leeds born and bred, came through at his boyhood club, played for them before uh, moving to Newcastle. Um, and I think that's that's probably the move that uh, would, as I said, give him the fairy tale end into the career. But uh, as you say, it's, he's been linked for a long time, um, but it just hasn't really materialised. Uh, and Leeds, um, I've got some midfielders which which I really like. It and Click, for example, has has stepped up to the Premier League, uh, scored in both of his first games, and, and looks really good. Um, you know, they, they look quite strong in the midfield. Um, we need that number eight. It doesn't really fit the bill. Um, I think the, the length of the contract would um, be an important um, sort of dynamic to this to this deal because, as you said, at, at 34, I reckon you could get sort of one, two years maybe. Yeah. Maybe out of it, you know, certainly one at the level that he is now. And, um, you know, as you said, despite how seriously he takes the fitness and all the Liverpool players will tell you that, you know, he is the fittest player in that squad. Um, to ask him to, to come and play that role in centre midfield for another two, three years. And and the thing is, is you know, he doesn't play game in, game out at Liverpool. Uh, and that would be more or less the expectation with a club like us or Leeds. You know, he'd, he'd play a good 75-80% of all the matches that we have in a season. It's, it's a big ask for someone of his age, but if the fee's there, right, and, and you can balance the playing time with his age, it, it would be a would be a nice deal and I think it gives us some needed experience it would and I think if you're considering the deal as a you know we're saying it doesn't fit the profile in terms of age and yeah sure that's completely fair but this is uh, a man who's won like three Premier Leagues he's won the the Champions League almost called it the European Cup then uh just Villa things um (laughs) you know he's he's played at the top level for so long uh and he's got he's like you know, people will like try and banter him and mug him off for being, you know, boring Milner. You know, we all love the account. Uh, he, but, you know, James Milner has this quite rare elite mentality that a lot of players don't seem to have. I was doing a bit of reading the other day uh, and there's an article in the Times where he says he only speaks to his children in Spanish because they're all trying to learn, like his whole family's trying to learn Spanish. Uh, and he's stubborn like that. So if his children <laughs> try to speak to him, he would only reply to them in Spanish and expect that they speak to him in Spanish, which um, <laughs> I, I don't know if he's angling for a move to Real or whatever, but you know, uh, I, it's, it's just stuff like that. It's funny, but it's like, it explains so much why Milner is, is so able to stay like at the peak of his power, still at 34, you know, outruns everybody at Liverpool. He, I think as well, you know, we've got a really good squad, like that 
the, the dressing room seems really close. And I think it wouldn't harm anyone really to have someone like Milner in who, you know, he, he can have a laugh with the lads and stuff, but he is, uh, you know, he, he's the model professional. He takes himself seriously. He's been at the club before. He know what it, he knows the expectation that's on the shoulders as soon as you walk out on the pitch at Villa Park. Um, and it was it was certainly a surprising link, but it, it got me really excited. It's you know relive them uh, O'Neill days that are, are kind of plagued with uh, you know uh, it, it, looking back, there were some good days, but with how we walked out, left the club, obviously the, the squad got picked apart. But you know you know back between like '06 and '09, watching that team: Milner, Barry, Downing, Carew, Gabby. There's just so many good memories, Dan. Yeah. And I think that that that's what you know. He played 123 times for the Villa, and um, the the Liverpool's last game against Chelsea was his 150th for Liverpool, um, which which is is crazy considering you know he went went won two Premier Leagues with Man City in in between yeah. those two clubs. Um, and so you you know it, as you said, there's so much romance surrounding that period, and the, and the fact that we haven't regardless of what people might and O'Neill split opinion he still does to this day I, I don't think that there is a sort of clear um, defining memory or like fans don't all see Martin O'Neill or that it, it run the same way there's no clear way of it's, it's sort of this real mixed um, sort of feeling of emotion when, when a lot of fans look back on that as you say mate because it was so good at points but it ended so badly um, but the fact of the matter is is we have never been that good not just since then, but probably in your and I, your and our lifetimes, maybe yeah. that, that's probably, um, you know, we sit here at the age of, of, you know, kind of coming into our, our early twenties, and that's by far and away the best best Villa side that we ever saw. So I think it's our generation in particular that look back on that era with such fondness, and that's why this deal sort of really tugs on the old heartstrings. Um, but you know, if, if taking all the emotion out of it, mate, I think he had. Um, a vital bit of experience to the least experienced aspect of our squad. Yeah. Um, you know, which is which is undoubtedly the midfield. That that you know, it's we have um, starting to pick experience into the squad now. But you know that that midfield needs it, um, especially I'm talking Premier League experience. Um, and so that would be great. Um, we we need an eight as well. So if yeah. it's that, he's got that great versatility which I probably think is, is the best thing about James Milner is that he, I think he's played pretty much every position on the pitch uh, for Liverpool but did for us as well which I think yeah. a lot of people sort of forget is that you know he started out on the right when we had, when he had that initial loan uh, from Newcastle which became a, a permanent a couple I think it was a couple of seasons later actually so I think he came on loan to us went back to Newcastle for a year and then we signed him um, yeah. and then carried on the right slotted into centre midfield um, and he uh, we had that a great midfield of Young, Barry, Downing, and Milner, which which you were just speaking about. Uh, and yeah, mate, as you say, I think um, you know, romance aside, whilst there is a great dose of that, it's, it would be it would be a good deal for this squad too. Absolutely, and on the complete other end of the spectrum in terms of age, potential, ability, Ismaili Assar, who signed for Watford uh, last summer. Before he signed for Watford as well, he was uh, within the top five most exciting prospects. Uh, under the age of 21, which is is quite impressive when you look, Watford were able to to, to come in for this guy, uh, and he definitely set the Premier League alight. Obviously, Watford did end up getting relegated, and he is still, uh, as as we're recording now on the on, on the on the Wednesday, a Watford player. He is, you know, I, I think he caught the headlines in the Liverpool game where Watford beat Liverpool on three uh, one, wasn't it? Um, yeah. And in a game that nobody expected. Uh, and if you look at his stats, 28 appearances, five goals, four assists. Again, you may not be enthralled by what this guy has to offer, but there's bags and bags of potential available. Liverpool were in for him. It seemed like an either or with, with Saar and Jota. They've obviously ended up paying the £41 million pounds for Jota from Wolves. Uh, but, you know, Saar, he, he adds... A much-needed dynamism to the to, to the forward line. He's quick. He's pacey. He can create these chances. You know, uh, he, he's he's a good assister. Obviously, he got four assists last season. Uh, makes plenty of passes. An average of eighteen a game. Uh, created nine big chances last season in the Premier League. And is again, it's just it's such an exciting link. Again, I can't believe Dan. We're still here. We've we've signed four players. 
Smith said the business isn't done, and we're still talking about such high, you know, potential high-profile signings like Saar. Yeah, it's it's a very um, it's an, it's one that interested me to be honest with you, and the fact this came about after we signed Traore because Saar plays on the same side. Yeah, um, and that that's what confuses me is that um, you know I think Villa fans really want Rashidka. Um, um, personally, in, in that camp, I think if you offered me out the two, whilst I absolutely love is my Lassar, um, and you know, I actually, as you say, mate, you know, it's when he came to Watford, I was blown away by that deal um, because of how exciting he was at Wren. Um, you know, he was playing, he was playing, playing stubborn eight, and he was tearing up Liga uh, at such a young age, coming out of Senegal, um, and I fully expected him to go to an elite European level club and then he signed for Watford and it sort of went under the radar for quite a yeah. long time. I was like, you know, this is a crazy, a crazy deal. I was like, Watford, if they can harness this, um, they've signed one of the best young players in, in world football. Um, and it started slowly for him and he didn't play much. I remember keep trying to like look, keeping an eye out for Watford and, and seeing if he was playing. It took him a while, and then suddenly in the second half of the season, it sort of snapped for him. And then you had that game like Liverpool, and then we started to see more of his pace, his one-on-one abilities, his nails for goal. And then you were like, right, right, okay, this is why this is why they picked him up. This is what he's capable of. Um, the problem is, if you're a Watford fan, it just came a little bit too late. Uh, I yeah. think it, it took too long for them to tap into that. Um, I would prefer Rashidska because he's more natural on the other side. Um, I think if we signed what uh, if we signed Saar, um, <laughs> we'd we'd sort of been asking him to fill in on the left, um, or you know, even what him or Bertrand has got to play in a slightly more favourable position. And that's not to say it can't be done. I just think if you're going to go and pay that money, um, you might as well pay it with someone that that is is bred to play the position that you're asking. Um, however, taking all that aside, he's an unbelievable talent and the resale value of this deal, I think is what you've got to look at. Um, because if, if we sign him and he comes on and he continues to establish himself and play like he did in the second half of the season with Waterford, then his, his transfer value just goes through the roof. Um, we're not going to be alone at looking at him. Uh, Liverpool have just uh, signed a Jota, but Man United apparently are still looking at Saar. So there's still some some big names that that we'd have to tempt him away from. Um, there's a few stumbling blocks. There's a few if buts and maybes around this deal. But I tell you what, mate, if if he did come to the Villa, then what an exciting signing it would be. It really would be, and as well, you know, maybe maybe Bertrand was a squad filler if if we get Saar because. As you say, they can't. They both play on the right. Maybe the plan is still for Grealish to play on the left. We've all seen the, uh, you know, the funny sport bible video with with Jack and Dean going at each other. Uh, it came up on my timeline again this morning about about which position is the best position for Jack, which you know is debatable. But uh, yeah, as you say, it, it doesn't really make much sense. But then again, you know, I look at the deal for Martinez in cash and what Smith was saying. With both of them, it's not very often, especially with with, with Emmy, is that you get to sign a player uh, f- for a fee like that that is yet to reach the peak of their powers. Villa haven't really done that for a while, uh, and 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 Saar is a long way off fulfilling his potential. But I I don't you know there's a, there's a huge ceiling with Saar. There really is, um, and you know whilst Villa don't want to become this kind of selling club, I think ultimately what what the ambition is for Villa. Um, and I, I hate to make this comparison because I'm sure people will laugh in the comments, but if you look at what Borussia Dortmund do in terms of de- developing young talent, sell it on, they still remain competitive in the league uh, and in domestic cup competitions. Obviously, they play European football. It's very much a model that other teams want to mimic. Uh, and you've just got to look at the kind of scouting si- systems that have been set up, the young players that we've been signing to the club, quite a few Dutch lads we've been picking up, uh, You know, even the likes of Louis Barry, uh, players like that, you know, high potential players in the academy, get them through the first team. Um, and I don't think there's anything wrong with selling your best players as long as there's players to replace them. Um, well, I think, mate, you, you've just got to look at um, the model that Langer built at Copenhagen. Yeah. Whereby they did bring through and, and continue to bring through so many players at low fees 
develop them and and whilst you know they are in a very limited market and and they're limited as to the players that they can keep they did manage to keep that flow of incomings and outgoings consistent but still compete in the in the super league still compete in european competition yeah you've absolutely hit the nail on the head there obviously we're talking about a completely different kettle of fish this is the premier league but there's no reason why villa can't keep you know finding these gems uncovering them flip them for, for big profits because there's no doubt Saar is going to be an £80 million player in two or three years' time, uh, especially mm-hmm. you know, with, with, with clubs such as United sniffing around. You can, pretty much, you, know, you can pretty much demand whatever transfer fee at the moment. United are that desperate. It's not even dead cert that he, he would even go to United considering how, how often they've missed out on their targets. Um, so yeah, Saar would be a, an incredibly exciting one, mate. And before we round it up, obviously, and we have to talk about this on the podcast, for two reasons. One, huge news, Keelan Davis has signed a new contract extension. Two, we have to make it official that there's this Twitter account called the Keenan Davis <laughs> Fan Club. And I would just like to point out that it is not me. And I would understand why you could think it's me. But even I am kind of bewildered by this. Now, I love Keenan. Keenan Van Nistelrooy, you know, it's a bit of a meme on the channel. I love Keenan. Um, I think there's potential with him. I will scrap anyone on that point. I'll, you know, I will die on that hill that Keenan Davis has the potential to become a very good player. I didn't make this uh, Twitter account, I'd just like to point out. Um, but with that news and Samata seemingly being linked with a move to Fenerbahce, uh, it look, you know, the striker talk keeps coming and a name that we've heard a few times throughout the window, we spoke about it, I've spoke about it on the BBC, Odd Swan Edwards. Um, now, at 40 million, it's a lot of money, it is. But this guy, he looks like an absolute baller from what we've seen. Again, we've done a podcast on Edward, so if you want to see that in more detail, uh, there will be a link to that in the description. Very exciting prospect for France. Incredible goal record for Celtic, Dan. Uh, I was telling you just before and I was speaking to a Scottish friend uh, who doesn't seem to think he's worth the money. But then again, he also said to me that he couldn't believe we paid two and a half million for John McGinn uh, because Celtic were trying to get him for like around 800k, uh, which I guess just shows you the, the lack of money that is in Scottish football. So well, for, for, for a local, 40 million, apparently too much. But again, this guy just looks so exciting, Dan. Yeah, absolutely, mate. Um, this is a player that I've spoken about and uh, on, a, on another part, uh, we did him in with, was it Sillison? Who was the I, other I player? I think it was, was, yeah. Edward, and, and it was when we were linked with Sillison and, and the Valencia raid. Um, and I love Odson Edward. Um, the thing is, is with the fee, is that I think it's very much a sort of... Um, testing the resolve of, of these, these Scottish clubs for those players. Yeah. Um, because, you know, Celtic can come out and say that they want £40 million for Odson Edward. He's not a £40 million pound player. Yeah. Um, n- never. But, you know, if you go and put the money in Celtic's face and you say, look, we'll give you £25. For a, cl- for, a, in a, for a club like them, in a league where they're in, if they went and bought a £25 million pound striker off the continent, um, he, he would go on and, and replace Edward no end. Do you know what yeah. I mean? And so it's just a matter of testing. Like, um, I liken it to uh, Alfredo Morelos uh, at Rangers, who, who is pretty much, you know, him and Edward are competing tip for tat as, for being the, the best striker in, in the SPL. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of baggage with Alfie, but you can't deny his goal record and that what he's been doing for Rangers, not just in the SPL, but in the Europa League. He was the top yeah. scorer in last year's Europa League. Um, he's an absolute bagsman. He's got a very similar goal record to Edward. Um, and he might be going out the door for Rangers for about 16 to 20 million. Um, just because once they're actually presented with this money, these SPL clubs, um, I think it's very difficult to say when, you know, when, as you said, when they're signing, looking at the likes of John McGinn for like 800K and someone comes in, right, we'll give you 25 million for your striker. Um, it's very difficult, yeah. very difficult to say, nah, come on, give us 40. Um, he's, <laughs> yeah. he, do you know what I mean? Absolutely. Um, so I think, you know, if you went and tested Celtic with, with a bid that's a little bit lower than their asking price, I think you could possibly nudge them. Um, they're, a player, they're a club that we've actually done a lot of dealing with in the past. We have quite a good relationship with, with Celtic, um, you know, sending players to and from. Most recently, Scott Sinclair, I want to say, is the yeah. latest player that's sort of gone between the clubs, which actually wasn't that long ago, believe it or not, only two, three seasons. Um, and so, yeah, like, look, 
I love Osana Dwight. I think he would be a great option. I, I question the need for another striker, really. Um, if we're playing 4-3-3, we have Watkins. I mean, it depends on Wesley. That's yeah. the big question mark, isn't it? It really does depend on Wes. You know, apparently he might be coming back in December. I've seen links, I've seen stories saying that we don't have long-term plans for Wes. Uh, there was a story run by the Daily Mail, which they then deleted. Uh, I don't know if you saw that, mate. So no. they ran a, a story saying that Wes wasn't going to be back until December, the Daily Mail. Tweeted, and then, but we had plans to sell him next season and then deleted it. So why? What that was about. Press office um, has been on that one. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I don't know. Wes is a big question mark, man. And only the guys at the club will know what Wesley's future is. And I think if we sign another striker, I think that's possibly an indicator that Wes could be going out the door because if we pay another and we have three, one £30 million striker in Ali Watkins, one £22 million striker in Wesley, and then another £25, £30 million striker. You can't rotate all three of them for one striking spot in a 4-3-3. One of them has to go, and that's when you have then a Keenan playing second or third fiddle. Um, so, it's all, it, you know, I think this deal, if it did go through, would be a, a big indicator on our big Brazilians' future, mate. Could you imagine, though, Villa, Dean Smith's tricky villains in Europe with those three strikers? The, the depth, I mean, it's insane. You, you know, not even, you know, your super clubs have, have that kind of depth, but... Yeah, it, a bit of a pipe dream. Hopefully uh, that article on Wes wasn't true because, you know, you guys know this is the Wesley Filler podcast. We're big fans of Wes. Uh, he can't come back soon enough for me. Uh, but yeah, that's a good note to end the podcast on. Dan, some great transfer rumours uh, that have been floating about recently. If you guys did enjoy this podcast, leave a like, subscribe and comment your thoughts on the signings. Do you think Milner and Saar would be good signings? And also, would you like to see Edward? What would that mean for Wes? We'd like to know all of your thoughts in the comments down below. Uh, so yeah, if you guys enjoyed, subscribe and up the villa. Jeff is essential to fulfilling this got potential. It's a main man, a hero. He's the main leader of the gang. Jeff, 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 he's the main leader of the gang now. Jeff.